name is Mike Lawton. I am the founder and CEO of Oxford Space Systems, and we are a space hardware business. We're venture capital backed, which means we have to be doing really exciting things with technology in order to uh, secure the level of external investment that we have. And the exciting technologies we're developing are deployable structures for space. And by deployable structures, we mean things like antennas, boom systems, and deployable panels. So the problem we're trying to solve at OSS is getting large structures on orbit. And the big challenge is fitting very large structures into very small rockets. So roughly 95% of a rocket is its fuel tank, which leaves us very, very little room to get a satellite and all its plethora of deployable structures. So that means everything that we do is driven by stowage efficiency and trying to make things as light as possible. So what we look for are materials that are very, very light that we can stow in a very efficient manner. And then we need to then use design practices that allow us to use those materials in a certain way that don't compromise their physical properties, but meet all the demands of going from the Earth's surface into orbit. So even before we put a structure on orbit, we have a pretty torturous existence to get through. Just getting from the Earth's surface to orbit takes around about 45 minutes to an hour, but it's incredibly violent. So that means all these lovely exotic structures that look very delicate on orbit, unfortunately, have to survive a very, very violent start to their life. And that drives all the design principles and choice of materials that we have to make. And it's pretty crazy when you think about it. A satellite can be on orbit anywhere from five years up to 25 years. But what drives all that design is just 45 minutes of its life. So it's a bit like buying a car. You just want a little city car, but you can't have that. You've got to buy a car that survives the Paris Dakar rally for 25 times. And that then is the design that we give you. So the whole idea of space design is driven just by 45 minutes at the start of life. So we have the challenge of excessive vibration and that drives the way we put materials together and the inherent design. So they've got to be very, very vibration proof. But once we're on orbit, we then open up our satellite and our structures to a whole range of other huge design challenges. So in low Earth orbit, it's fairly benign in terms of temperature. It's not as cold as hot as people think. If you get it right, you're going to see temperatures of around about minus 60 to around about plus 60 plus 80 so it's not crazy crazy but you know it, it's a tough it's a tough temperature range uh, we then have radiation effects but we still enjoy a little bit of protection from the earth's uh, magnetic field so it's not as intense as people think we have astronauts in orbit on the space station but the one effect which really drives a lot of our design is something called atomic oxygen or atox it's the last wisps of the Earth's atmosphere being broken apart by the effects of radiation. And atomic oxygen, the clues in the name, the oxygen becomes a bit like a free radical banging around looking for something to react with. And if it gets into the sort of materials that we're designing to go on orbit, it can literally cause significant damage. So for instance, one of the materials we use on orbit is carbon fiber. Unless that's designed in a certain way, Atox will get inside that material and shred it. It can make hard carbon fiber end up looking like tissue paper. So all these effects we need to understand and design for. And another huge challenge uh, in space, no matter what orbit you're in, is the hard vacuum. So in mechanical design, we take things like lubricants and greases for absolute granted here terrestrially and we have a vast exotic range of lubricants we can use. The one thing you can't use in a vacuum is a lubricant or a grease because it instantly vaporizes. So if you've got a very expensive satellite with a very expensive camera system, the last thing you want is a thin film of grease over the lens, which means you therefore need to look at materials which are self-lubricating, for instance, things like PTFE. And we have to avoid metal on metal contact in a gear system, for instance, because once you're in a hard vacuum and you don't have a lubricant, we have something called cold metal welding. 
Metals actually get confused, if you like, when they're in precision contact with each other. And you almost get an exchange of molecules, so the metals end up welding themselves together, called cold metal welding. So we avoid metal on metal. So all these things conspire to drive choice of materials and the design techniques that we need to, to employ at OSS. So I mentioned the challenge of stowage efficiency. How small can we stow uh, structures? So at OSS, we don't just design the structures, we actually design the materials ourselves to make up some of these structures. So on our team, yes, we have the usual range of thermal mechanical design engineers, but we also have material scientists helping us develop our own materials. And our most mature material that we currently have on orbit that we're demonstrating is what we call a high strain composite. So most people are familiar with carbon fibre, normally a thick rigid material. If you own a tennis racket or a you know, fishing rod or whatever, invariably it's made of carbon fibre. So you're familiar with what we call the kinematic properties. However, we've developed a lot of intellectual property on turning this material into a material that can deploy. So we have all the advantages of carbon fibre, but now it's super flexible, we can roll and stow it in a very small volume for launch and then on orbit we can get it to deploy and become a structure. So here it is in its most simplest form. So turning this material into a useful product we have a very simple demonstration here. So if we contain the material in a little cassette system and put a very simple motor system around it we turn this violent release of material into a very controlled deployment in a very very compact ultra lightweight deployment boom system and what looks like a large sugar cube on the end this is representative of a typical payload that we would fly on orbit so if you wanted to measure the earth's magnetic field you would use something called a magnetometer which looks a bit like this large sugar lump and the reason we need it on a boom away from the spacecraft we want to deploy it into clean space so it's measuring the earth's magnetic field and not the parasitic magnetic field of the spacecraft so the further you get away the higher the quality of your measurements and of course we can reverse it as well it's not just a, a single shot so in this case you can imagine we could deploy at various radii from the spacecraft and carry out a whole range of interesting scientific experiments. So this is a very, very simple demo. A more complex version of this is currently flying above us at an altitude of about 650 kilometers in low Earth orbit. And we've deployed and retracted this boom a number of times to verify all the kinematic predictions we made about this material when we subject it to the space environment. So effects of ATOX, radiation and temperature cycling. And we've been on orbit about 22 months now and it's going well so far. So there's a very simple uh, boom system. Uh, we can then make more exotic shapes uh, with the carbon fiber. And here's a great e example. So what I have here is what we call a rib or rib spar. And this is one small part of a much, much larger antenna. You can see a very small antenna here. And you can see the profile, hopefully, on the end of, of these ribs. We call it a lenticular profile. So when it's deployed, we get all the advantages once again of carbon fiber, but if I just pinch this, you'll see the rib collapses, which means we could then roll this rib around a central hub such that when we release it, it will spring out and give us a radial format of, of, of ribs. So this is a very, very lightweight structure that gives us a large deployed diameter on orbit. And we have a saying in, in the space industry, you can never be too light and your antennas can never be too big. Because the larger the antenna you can deploy on orbit, essentially the higher its commercial value. Um, it's all about what we call link budgets. There's a reason we have these huge satellite dishes trying to listen to very, very distant star stars the other way around. The bigger the dish you have on Earth, the further star away you can listen to. On orbit, the bigger the satellite dish, the higher the quality of your communication link. And with the trend in space engineering to make satellites smaller and smaller and smaller, the laws of physics still prevail. You may make your satellite smaller, but you still need a big antenna to talk to the Earth. So a lot of the value in what we're doing at OSS is about stowage efficiency. What is the largest antenna we can fit in the smallest possible volume? So that's carbon fiber. 
and that gives us the so-called backing structure. We then need a surface for this antenna. And we're working on two types of surfaces here at OSS. Um, one is a, a shape memory membrane. So imagine if I got a, a large steel ball bearing and I poured something like silicon bath sealant over it. And then I remove the ball bearing and turn that surface over. You can imagine a super smooth surface that if I scrunched up and let go, it would naturally want to spring back and take that parabolic shape. That's exactly the principle we take to making large parabolic antenna surfaces. We use a more exotic version, obviously, than bath sealant, and we need that to behave as an RF surface, so we need different types of materials in there. But the principle is exactly the same. If we mold it on a beautiful, high-precision parabolic, when we get it on orbit and we remove gravity, it will, it will form a precision parabolic. So to allow that structure to get on orbit, we need a backing structure uh, as well. Other types of antenna don't actually need such an exotic uh, membrane. We can get away with this material. So this is, it looks like ladies tights, but it's not. This is what we call a metal mesh. And I can be really quite brutal with it. I can scrunch it up, but then if I tension it in the appropriate way, I can end up with a super smooth surface. So the wire we're using here has to have a whole range of properties, as you might imagine, to survive in space. When we subject, subject it to temperature extremes, we don't want to expand and contract too much because it would then distort. So we need a wire with a very good coefficient of thermal expansion, or CTE. We also want the uh, wire to survive an ATOX environment. But most importantly, we need it to behave like a great reflector RF surface. So we end up using a type of metal called gold-plated molybdenum, or gold-plated moly. The molybdenum wire gives us the strength and the thermal properties we want, with a very thin layer of gold on top. That soft metal, that when we tension the underlying molybdenum wire, it causes the gold to bite into itself, because gold's a very soft metal. And that then forms a very, very good electrical surface, because when we're flying through the upper wisps of the atmosphere in low Earth orbit, that can build up a charge and cause a static problem. So gold-plated moly helps dissipate those charges and gives us a lovely electrical surface. This is rather dull and not looking gold, because this isn't gold-plated moly. This is a tungsten wire that we use to carry out all our R&D with. So if we can prove it works with a much cheaper wire, such as tungsten, we can then replicate it with gold-plated moly. Now, some unusual, th unusual things about what we're, we're doing here, and uh, most people are surprised that we actually look to the fishing industry to make space antennas. So a very, what might be seen as a low-tech, historic industry on Earth is helping the space industry. And the reason we look at the fishing industry is, when you think about fishing nets, they actually have a lot of the same challenges we have with space antenna surfaces. So if you want a fishing net, you want to be able to scrunch it up to put it on, on the back of a boat, but you want to be able to deploy it and go fishing with it without it tangling. So we need knitting patterns that don't lend themselves to tangling. The other big challenge with a fishing net is if it gets a hole in it, you don't want rip propagation. You want the hole to be maintained. Well, on orbit, if we have a micrometeorite go through our antenna, the last thing we want to do is have the antenna rip open. So actually, what we do is borrow fishing patterns from fishing nets to knit antenna surfaces. But of course, we're not using twine. We're using wires, in this case, that are even thinner than the diameter of a human hair, which causes us a lot of challenges when you're trying to knit in a very precise way at those sorts of dimensions. So there's an example of an antenna surface that when I apply it to this type of backing structure and we tension it, we get a very, very high storage efficiency, but fantastically performing uh, RF antenna.